For this project, we're going to build a very basic oscilloscope with a 5x7 LED matrix. And we're going to do it the hard way. There are driver chips that make it much easier to drive these LED matrices, but this is a good way to learn how they work. We're using a PIC 12 F683 microcontroller. We're only going to need 4 pins, so this PIC is more than enough. We need one analog input and three digital outputs. This is the LED matrix we're going to use. These LED matrix displays have for each row or column, depending on the orientation, five lines of common cathodes and seven lines of common anodes. This means that we cannot simply hook up the LED cathode to ground with the current limiting resistor and drive high the anode of the LED we want to light up. We have to drive high the anode line and drive low the cathode line so that they intersect and make the one LED we want light up. We also have to take care that all the other lines are correctly set up. This also means that we won't be able to make a diagonal line of LEDs. If we set up each of the LEDs in that diagonal, we'll just end up with all of the LEDs lit up at the same time. So we'll have to light each of them on for short periods of time, fast enough that we can fool our eyes into seeing one still image. We're also going to use a CMOS chip, which is very useful, the SN74HC595. It's basically a serial to parallel converter. They're very useful as digital output multiplexers, for example. With only three wire communication with a PIC, you can have as many digital output ports as you want. These chips have 8 outputs, but they can easily be daisy chained. So all you need to do is send as many bits out as the number of chips you're using multiplied by 8. You can use them to control a bunch of LEDs, or you can use them to control for example relays, but you won't be able to drive them directly. For that, one option would be to use the ULN2803 transistor array for example. For this example, since it's a 5x7 LED matrix, we're going to need 7 bits for the anode lines and 5 bits for the cathode lines, a total of 12. Since we have two 74HC595, there will be 4 unused bits, but we will still need to send out 16 bits, otherwise they won't be set up correctly. We're going to have an analog input. In the schematic it's a potentiometer, but it can be connected to any source that outputs between 0 and 5 volts, and if it's AC, it should have a DC offset of 2.5 volts. On to the code. We have more or less the same configuration as the previous video, but we can see there's an extra header and C file for the 74HC595. I find it useful when using other devices to put their code in separate files. It makes it easier to reuse when you want to add them to a new project. If we look in the main header, we can see the constants for the oscillator frequency, the setting for capturing the analog port 0, and then we have the values for the steps and rows of the LED matrix. For the steps, you can see that the 1s are where the LEDs on that step are supposed to be on, and on the rows, the zeros are where the LEDs on that row are supposed to be on. Like I explained before, for the anodes, high value is on, and for cathodes, low value is on. We also have some variable arrays. The buffer is where we'll keep the values for each step from 1 to 5, and the step out is where we'll keep the actual information that will be sent out to the 74HC595. Then we have some function declarations that we'll go over next. In the 74HC595 header, we have the aliases for the digital output pins to communicate with the 74HC595 chips. On the C file you see the code to send the data to the 74HC595, and this is written looking at the timing tables and diagrams in the datasheet. Looking at our program, we can see the setup routines in the beginning, this time quite simpler than the previous video, there are no timers or PWM to deal with. So all we have to do is set the internal clock frequency and the I.O. ports. This is our infinite loop. First thing we do is capture the analog port 0 value, and from that value we convert it to a 1 to 5 value. 
well, actually a 0 to 4 value, but it corresponds to the 5 cathode lines of the LED matrix. The routine that does the conversion is called get short value. Next, we're going to add the value to the buffer. What this does is to push all existing values forward and add the new value in the first position. The last value is always lost. After that, we're going to prepare the data to send out. What we'll do here is go through the seven steps and do an AND logical operation between the constant for the step and the one for the row. To do that, we use two functions that return the step constant depending on the position we're preparing and the row constant depending on the value we have for the buffer on that position. These functions are getStep and getRow. Back in the prepare function, we can see there's some extra code. This is to create vertical lines when the values in the buffer jump from one value to a value that would leave a gap in between. It looks nicer if we have, for example, a square wave, and instead of just having horizontal lines, we also have vertical lines connecting them. Once all the steps are prepared, it's time to send the data out, one step at a time. After each step, we're going to have a small delay. This delay should be just as long as needed to appear that all the LEDs are on simultaneously, with no flickering, but not too long that it's unable to represent the faster changes in the inputs. Once we're done, we can build the project and then program our microcontroller. Let's look at the breadboard. I'm going to turn on the power and see how it responds to turning the potentiometer. Seems to be working okay. Now let's see how it works with the function generator and go through some different waveforms. And now how it reacts to changing the frequency between 1 and 10 Hz. <laughs> 